All right, great. Um, hey, welcome everybody today to um, uh, Dr. Tony Contento's uh, presentation on improving transnational water security in the islands of the South Pacific. And let me just tell you a little bit about uh, Tony here. Tony uh, is a plant, plant cell physiologist from Central New York. He is the program coordinator for the general education curriculum for CSU Global. He's also the interim director of the State University of New York at Oswego Agricultural Testing and Analysis Laboratory, where he is a member of the Biological Sciences Department. He earned his doctoral degree in molecular biology from the University of Wyoming, working under Randy Lewis on characterizing the structural and mechanical properties of spider silk proteins. After graduation, Dr. Cateno spent 10 years as a research scientist and lecturer at Iowa State University, studying plant stress responses and macro audio bagi <laughs> under Dwayne Bassham. And I hope I got that right, uh, Tony. His research, Diane, yeah. Diane Bassam. <laughs> Diane Bassam. His research is focused on nutrient, oxidative, and osmotic stress. His research, his current research is focused on improving post-harvest agricultural technology and water security. Tony, take it away. Thank you, Rob. So welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. For those of you listening later, uh, again, if you have questions uh, during the presentation, just feel free to, to hit the chat box or uh, pipe up. Um, but if you have questions watching this later on, you can always email me and I'm happy to chat about my research. So, um, there we go. So, uh, water, fresh water as it is, is a finite resource. So, it's something uh, that we are running out of uh, on this planet. Now, in places like central New York, where I am, that seems silly, but uh, for people, like Rob in California and for the folks that are in Colorado, um, you know what droughts are like, what serious droughts are like. When, when we have a drought in New York, you know, our, our onion harvest uh, is 20% down. You know, when you have a drought out in Colorado, you know, people start planting rock gardens and, you know, you're only allowed to take one shower a day. So uh, that's just going to keep getting worse as the years go by. So when I graduated uh, with my PhD, uh, my wife wanted to get her degree in horticulture. So uh, we went to Iowa State University and I got into uh, plant physiology and biochemistry. And it's different than what I was doing, um, but I decided to take that focus. When you're at Iowa, Iowa State, either you work on agriculture uh, or you work on livestock. And, and those are really your two choices. Uh, if you want to do any kind of research. So I went to the plant route because it was something different for me. And, you know, it was interesting, but, but it was basic science. A lot of the work I was doing is basic science. And with basic science, uh, we're answering the unasked questions. So basic science is done to sort of build up uh, the general knowledge so we can, uh, you know, I, I, I've been in an extremely applied project. Uh, the, the spider sub project that I was in was designed uh, to create synthetic spider silk. So to take the protein sequences from uh, the spider silk that we had and use them to make all different kinds of products. So, I mean, it was a very crunchy, almost engineering uh, project. Uh, and then I moved into basic science and basic science never really gets anybody excited because you're under the realization that only seven people are reading your paper. And of those seven, four of them are going to disagree with what you have to say. So, you know, it's, it's, you have free time on your hands, at least your, your mind wanders. Uh, and, you know, I, I was paying attention to the news a lot. And one thing that I saw this was during the, the George W. Bush years, and that President Bush and his family, uh, and Dick Cheney and his family, were buying up land in South America. And they were buying up this land uh, that was part of the Garani Reservoir or Aquifer. And what this is, is the, the world's big 
biggest uh, regenerating aquifer. So this is an underground, you know, tunnel with wells. Uh, but they were purchasing this land, and I started digging into uh, the issues with water security. You know, the fact that so much of our available fresh water is moving under private control. There we go. And let's go back to sharing. Okay. Hopefully, there we go. So uh, I'll be honest, it got me mad. Uh, not that I was particularly mad at, at the president or the vice president for purchasing something that would basically be very profitable sometime in the future. Uh, but the fact is, is that I, I view water as sort of a public good. Water is something that should be accessible to all and should be available to everyone, um, but it gets polluted. Uh, and the, the majority of pollution these days going into the water supply is not necessarily from industry, uh, but it's from the ocean. You know, as sea levels rise, as we get more and more of these storms, only these protected underground water sources uh, are going to remain fresh water. And you will find that wells uh, and other water resources are slowly going to become more and more salty. And that also happens with drought. So I started looking into this and I wanted to learn more about it. Um, and I changed sort of my research focus. Um, again, I was doing basic science before, but I started to take on more agricultural project, projects or projects that would touch on agronomy. Uh, because again, 50% of the water that we use is to grow our food. Uh, I also started getting interested in hydroponics and aquaponics. So hydroponics use a liquid medium uh, to grow our, our food plants. So basically the roots are soaking in the nutrient uh, rich broth uh, and there's no soil, and these can be grown anywhere. Aquaponics takes it one step further, and you grow fish, uh, and you take the waste from the fish. They have to be freshwater fish, obviously, uh, but then you use that waste, and all you really are doing is moving the water from the aquarium under the plants uh, so that it washes over their roots, and using that as a nitrogen source for the plants. So both of these got me very excited. Uh, I also looked into current water harvesting and reclamation. Uh, I looked into desalination. Um, the fact that uh, currently our desalination plants uh, outside of the U.S. are running at full capacity. So if you go to some place uh, in the Middle East, their desalination plants can't provide any more fresh water than they already are. So they're already running at maximum. Uh, so the only thing they can do is build more plants, uh, and that's what they do. Uh, I got really interested in low-tech water harvesting, and I'm going to talk about that. Uh, and I was very lucky uh, that Ron Mittler was at Iowa State during the first few years of my, my time there. Uh, Ron Mittler is an Israeli scientist. He came to, to Iowa State to uh, do research there, um, and he was focused on drought physiology. So what he wants to do is grow plants in the desert. Um, he got a better job offer um, from University of Nevada at Las Vegas. Uh, made a little more sense that's in the desert as well. Uh, and he moved there. But I mean, for about three years, he and I worked on a couple of projects together. Uh, and I really got to understand um, what happens to plants during drought and how water stress or osmotic stress uh, can affect different properties. Uh, so some plants that you grow, if you're just eating the, the vegetative parts, uh, they're gonna make smaller plants, but they can still basically grow under drought conditions. Uh, if you want the seeds though, you know, if we're harvesting wheat or corn or something like that, uh, you can't have drought. You're just gonna basically produce nothing except for leaves and then stalks. So, it was great, uh, great time, um, but I needed to expand my horizons uh, beyond agriculture. So what I started doing was looking around. The first thing I found was FogQuest, and I, I work with these people. Uh, it's a Canadian organization. 
Uh, and what they do is they create these polypropylene nets uh, down in the mountains in Chile on the seaward facing side of the mountain. And all it is is just a plastic net, uh, but because the polypropylene can sort of capture but not absorb this water, uh, it allows the water coming in from the sea breezes uh, to be captured by the net and then it runs down into these, these pipes here. And that goes down into a cistern or a reservoir somewhere down the mountain. Um, this project was really successful when I was when I was involved with it, uh, but uh, it, you know it, it started to go by the wayside. So there was about a five-year period where the net started to get in disrepair. There wasn't a lot of money for it, um, and what they did is they created a membership uh, fee. So. If any of you are concerned in water security, just to give a plug for the organization, uh, for $40 a month, you can be a member of the organization. Basically, it's a donation. Uh, your money goes to helping maintain these nets. And what these nets do is they keep these farmers in the lowlands in Chile uh, and Argentina uh, able to water their crops. Uh, they're very successful. Um, this is extremely low tech, as you might imagine. But again, wind and storms tear these nets apart, and they do have to kind of be contiguous uh, in order for the system to work. So I, I started looking more into low tech ideas. Uh, here's one, I'm not involved in this one, uh, but this is a similar idea for the work of water design. This is a water harvesting tower in Africa. And what you basically have here is a combination of natural and nylon fibers. And what it does is early in the morning, it captures water uh, and then puts it down here in your reservoir. And you can build these in different sizes. These are actually the medium sized ones. I think these ones can capture about 12 gallons. Uh, they have bigger ones that are like little pavilions. Those can capture up to 24 gallons in a day. So it's a lot of water just capturing it from the condensation from the water vapor at night. Again, low tech. All you have to do is basically weave these baskets, set them up, and they'll keep gathering uh, as long as they're kept in good repair. I needed more people. Uh, this, there were people who were very passionate about this at Iowa State, but there wasn't a lot of expertise. So I uh, joined Chemists Without Borders for a while. I also joined a crowdsourcing firm called Idea Connection. Uh, and both of these are looking for help from other scientists uh, to sort of come together and answer big questions. So for Chemists Without Borders, um, a lot of the work I was doing is focused on water cleanup uh, in Bangladesh. So most of our uh, textiles that, that have a lot of colors in them uh, come from Southeast Asia. And um, these textiles, these vibrant colors are created through a variety of heavy metals. Uh, arsenic uh, being the, the largest pollutant, uh, but there's also titanium for bright whites. Uh, there's nickel, there's copper um, and so on. So we created, uh, we had two projects. One was a contaminated water cleanup tool kit. And again, this was a low tech kit that would help people uh, who take water out of the river, make sure that they get rid of all the heavy metals from it. Uh, these things had to cost a penny a kit uh, because of the part of the world that it was in. So we really, really needed to, to have something that was effective, but extremely inexpensive. And I think we were able to create that. Uh, the other one is arsenic cleanup in Bangladesh. And again, arsenic uh, is the number one contaminant uh, in the rivers in this area. And we worked on a variety of methods, again, to be able to clean these up for home use uh, and for municipal use. With Idea Connection, um, this was able to network with, uh, with more different kinds of people. I actually took on a role as a facilitator here. And again, this is sort of paid volunteer work. Um, if somebody likes your idea, uh, they'll pay you for it. But I mean, essentially what you're doing here is networking. Um, so we worked on hydroponics, different kinds of hydroponic substrates. Uh, we really looked at coconut coir, uh, which is the, the outside wrapping on the coconut. 
as a possible substrate. Typically, people use uh, clay beads, which are good, but they're expensive and they're not usually available everywhere. Um, but the project that really got um, me going with water security, especially in the South Pacific, was drought protection in Australia. So Australia had a 10-year drought, well, more than a 10-year really, but uh, running from about 1996, 1997, uh, all the way through 2009, um, where it really crippled Australian agriculture, both uh, growing of crops and livestock. So here we've got a picture of, uh, at the height of the drought, this is an Australian reservoir, and you can see how much the water has gone down. So this led to a number of different uh, acts uh, the Water Act in 2007. Uh, there was a formation of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority um, in 2008, and then the publication of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan in 2012. And what this legislation did uh, was basically say that water in Australia needs to be protected. Um, they need to reduce evaporation, they need to teach conservation and control use. Uh, and in the beginning, this was never going to pass. So it, it, the reason that this legislation didn't happen in 2001, 2002 uh, is because there was pushback. Um, really, this was only affecting the agricultural sector, and it took several years for prices to get up to a point where the general public decided they wanted to do things. But uh, through Idea Connection, we were tapped uh, to come up with a method to stop evaporation in their reservoirs. So we had three major suggested methods. Uh, one is a product called Aquitaine. And what Aquitaine is, is a biodegradable silicon-based uh, product that covers the top of the reservoir and prevents evaporation. Now, this doesn't affect fish breathing. Uh, this doesn't affect birds. Uh, it does affect insects, uh, so it's not 100% ideal. Uh, in places with mosquito problems, they actually use Aquitaine uh, to kill mosquito larvae. But um, that was one option that we offered. Another was uh, a floating styrofoam uh, hexagon. And these uh, later became Hexaprotect. Uh, and the nice thing about these is, is they have little magnets on them. Uh, but they'll self-assemble even without the magnets. The magnets just kind of keep them uh, from being blown around in the wind. But basically, you dump these from a dump truck, uh, and they self-assemble on the surface. Now, the reason we like the Hexaprotect is because we also had an idea that what we would do is scatter throughout these hexagonal uh, styrofoam floats. What we would have are little solar-powered uh, hexagons that would draw water vapor out of the air uh, and deposit it into the reservoir. Uh, and we actually created a model that could create about half a liter an hour. Um, so what this just would do is they would scatter throughout uh, this sort of mass of little floating hexagons. Uh, we would have little tiny water vapor capturing uh, sort of atmospheric water generators. Um, and then the last one were the armor balls. The armor balls are just little plastic balls that, again, you dump from a dump truck and they kind of cover the surface. And what they do is they just reduce evaporation. Uh, in the end, they went with Aquitaine. Uh, they liked the chemical idea. Uh, they liked the fact that it would eventually just go away. It's biodegradable. It's not going to harm birds or fish uh, or other big wildlife. And they don't like mosquitoes anyway. So that wasn't really uh, something that was gonna be a deal breaker. But during this time, uh, working on this project, I met Mitchell Helt. And Mitch is a mechanical engineer from Iowa, so he was nearby. Uh, and he had a lot of contacts in the South Pacific. Uh, he was working um, with the US Agency uh, for International Development and the Pacific Center for Environment and Sustainable Development, which is through the University of South Pacific. And through his contacts, uh, we were able to work with both people from the UN and people from 
the island nation of Kiribati uh, to start talking about uh, sustainable power, uh, water harvesting, and hydroponics. So Kiribati is the largest island nation in the South Pacific, uh, and it will be gone by 2050. So uh, with the predicted rise in, in, in sea level, it's not going to be there. And the reason is, is, is it's barely above sea level now. I mean, looking at this uh, picture, this thin strip of land here, that's maybe about two to four feet above sea level. Uh, everything on these sides, these are just probably maybe one or two feet above sea level um, with wave action. So um, the island is slowly being washed away. Uh, Kiribati was originally a British colony, uh, it gained its independence, um, and it's huge. Um, I mean, we're talking about hundreds of miles, hundreds of square miles of space that is owned by this nation. Um, the largest islands are Tarawa and Kiramas. So Tarawa, and Kiramas are both atolls, which means they've got a lagoon in the middle. These are collapsed volcanoes. And um, they, this is where the agriculture is. The majority of people live on these two large islands. There are several islands uh, where there's no population. But of these smaller islands, even today, they're disappearing. Uh, there's a few hundred thousand people that live in this nation. And they're basically going to be without homes. So the plan for the people of Kiribati is migration. Um, some of them are going to move to Samoa. Uh, some of them are going to move to Guam. And some of them are going to move to Australia. But uh, by 2050, there, there won't be any place to stand uh, that isn't covered by water. So the projects that Mitch and I are working on are not necessarily to, to save the islands because we can't. Um, but what we're trying to do is make it sort of affordable to live there for as long as possible. The first wave of people leaving Kiribati are going to be uh, young people who are going to go to different universities uh, sort of around the South Pacific. Uh, to become skilled laborers. There's scholarship programs um, that are helping them do that. And a lot of this money comes from the EU. Um, some of it came from the United States and I'm not sure if that's gonna continue. Um, USA was helpful for a while, but um, my guess would be that that's not gonna be there anymore. But the EU is still providing a decent amount of money. Uh, there's a consortium of nations in the South, South Pacific and some money is coming from places like New Zealand uh, and Australia to help these people get settled elsewhere. Um, but again, that first wave of people will go to become skilled laborers. Uh, then the people that are already skilled will start moving over. Uh, and eventually uh, families and elderly uh, will be brought over as communities are created in these other nations. So what we want to do is make sure that these people have enough water enough food and enough power um, to eventually leave. So again, um, this, is, uh, this is a coconut plantation on Tarawa. Um, and you can see that just, this is just after a storm. Um, so these coconut plants are in trouble because uh, this is seawater. Um, coconuts can stand some salt water, but, but not a uh, long-term submersion in salt water. And it gets worse uh, for crops. So the majority of what Kiribati exports is fish and coconuts. Uh, but again, when these storms come in, uh, this is what happens, all right? So a majority, 60 to 70 percent of the fresh water that Kiribati produces is used to wash these crops after storms. Um, the salt water has to get off of these leaves before they shrivel uh, or else they won't have anything to eat. So these are yams 
Um, this is pretty bad. Uh, this is this probably was a really bad storm. This, this farmer is probably trying to save plants uh, to be transferred to somewhere in the highlands. So um, they need to produce water, not just for potable drinking water, but they need to produce water uh, to wash their plants after storms. Not just for irrigation, not just to kind of to water them. They actually need to wash these plants off uh, probably several times during the rainy season. Uh, another problem on Kiribati is uh, that the fresh water, uh, again, is becoming more and more salty. So on an island like Hawaii, where there's a lot of highlands, what you have are several different kinds of places where water can get stored. Uh, water can get stored in the highlands through percolation. Uh, it can get trapped in the highlands as perched water. Um, you can have large structures called dikes that the water is protected from the salt water. But on most islands uh, in the Pacific, actually most islands anywhere, uh, in uh, several different kinds of peninsula, what you have is something called a freshwater lens. All right, and this is a freshwater aquifer of water trapped directly under the landmass uh, that can be tapped with wells and other things. All right. On an island like Kiribati, uh, you don't have any highlands. So all you have is that freshwater lens, all right? The purity of that freshwater lens is dependent upon the sea level and upon how much land uh, is not touched by the ocean. So every time seawater invades, whether it's a storm, whether it's a tide, the freshwater lens gets smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually there's no freshwater available for the island. And when that happens, that's it. You know, that's your desert island. Uh, you know, you could barely grow palm trees and coconut trees there. So um, that's what's happening to Kiribati. As the sea level rises, this freshwater lens is, is getting smaller and smaller until eventually there's not going to be any freshwater available. And on some of the islands, it's already happened. On some of the smaller islands, if you tap for water, it's so salty you can't use it for anything. Uh, it's not potable. It can't be used for agriculture. It can barely be used for washing clothes. So um, that's how we're trying to help. So we wanted a low tech method. Uh, we wanted something that we could set up. It would cost, uh, you know, less than fifty dollars, uh, and it would produce water indefinitely. So we created a solar still. Now this entire project requires uh, PVC piping, uh, specialized solar absorptive paint, which again, you can buy at any hardware store, uh, and a food quality uh, reservoir to capture the water. And what happens is, is hot air captures uh, solar radiation, it uses that heat to draw cool water uh, from lower down in the ocean up here uh, where it comes in contact with the humidity. Now that cool water is going to cool the pipes uh, that, that are containing it. And that's actually going to allow for condensation to occur. Just like a glass of ice water on a hot day, uh, condensation gathers there it'll gather because of this water transfer. And what'll happen is, is that condensation will be captured in a separate pipe, uh, which will be collected uh, over time. Now we've got a couple of different uh, iterations of this. Some of them are small and they only capture a couple of liters a day. Some of them are huge and they can capture up to 25 or 50 liters a day. But what would happen is, is these would be shipped out, they'd be assembled, they'd be put offshore where it's deep enough for us to get access to the cold water, uh, and then they'd just run. And people would swim out, they'd gather the, the food quality reservoir, they'd bring it in, they'd still probably have to purify it a little bit. Uh, it's not that it's not pure, uh, but there's only so much we can do to prevent contamination from the air. But it'd definitely be able to be used immediately for agriculture. Um, and considering that's the primary direction that most of the water on these islands is going, um, that's probably what it'd be used for. Here's a different image. Get it? There we go. 
here's a different image showing it a little bit. Um, here's the solar chimney. And again, this is just a specialized spray paint that we'd spray right onto the PVC um, that would help that pipe gather heat. Uh, and again, it would pull up water through the condensing coils and allow for capture uh, and extraction of that condensation. So extremely low tech. If you have a pond uh, in your backyard that's deeper than 10 feet, you could probably set this up and gather a decent amount of water. The nice thing about the South Pacific is the humidity is really high and the, the heat's really high. So there's a big difference uh, between the surface temperature and the temperature of the water uh, once you get down a couple of meters. So uh, this works really, really well. Uh, this could work just as easily off the coast of California, uh, um, you know, in the Suez Canal, wherever you want to put it. It just needs access to high humidity and decent heat. But we're also uh, working to help pursue renewable energy, uh, solar power. There's plenty of sunlight in Kiribati. So uh, solar power is one way uh, that we can actually make sure they have enough electricity. The thing to keep in mind is that for over 100 years, um, the majority of Kiribati's electric plants were run on diesel fuel. So they would buy diesel fuel from Australia and from New Zealand. Uh, it would come over on ships, it would go into their electric plants, they would run the electric plants. And those electric plants would run uh, their desalination plants and all their electrical systems on the islands. Uh, and as of last year, they've completely removed any of these diesel plants. They're all basically shuttered and they've moved over to solar power. Um, we're also pushing hydroponics. Uh, the nice thing about hydroponics is, is even in these simple sort of plastic dome situations, uh, they're protected from the sea storms. So Less water is used in hydroponics in general, but no water would really have to be used to wash the sea spray off of these plants. So uh, we're trying to get them uh, to, to work with the hydroponics uh, to see if that works. Um, there's plenty of sunlight. Uh, the temperature does become an issue. Um, usually in these situations, you'd have cooling. Um, so what we've had to work on is more of a curtain-based system. Uh, where curtains are dropped in the middle of the day so the plants don't get too hot. Uh, light can still go through, just not as much. The reason this is important in the South Pacific is that all of the islands uh, in this shaded area are at risk to rising sea levels. Um, the most at risk outside of Kiribati um, are Tuvalu and Vanuatu. Uh, those are those are next by by 2100. Those islands will be gone as well. Uh, but it's just going to keep getting worse as sea levels continue to rise. Uh, we do have some high tech solutions uh, that we've looked at. Um, these aren't my examples, but these are these are just some modern products that are using. Uh, we've got our own uh, atmospheric water generators um, that are. Household size, um, building size, and municipal size. So different sizes for, for different uses. But uh, some of these uh, are solar powered. So like the Fontis system here, the, the Fontis system uh, uses uh, solar electricity uh, to capture water vapor. Uh, this system was specifically designed to basically put on the bottom of a bike uh, and it can capture about a half a liter of water an hour, which is plenty uh, for a bike ride. There's another system over here, the Max Water, and the Max Water uses wind power in a similar manner uh, to generate uh, potable water that can be stored in a reservoir or cistern down below. The big push is for sea breeze harvesting. Uh, so this is an actual building uh, that is in um, Yemen that can collect water. Uh, so what it does is, is the sea breeze comes in and there are electric cooling elements uh, on the insides of these walls. 
And what they do again is they, they cause the condensation uh, to occur, and then it's collected down in a reservoir below. These, these devices are, are capable of capturing hundreds of liters of water um, during the early morning hours. So, uh, and it's the nice thing about this is, is the, the way that they're captured, they can actually generate electricity. So uh, when you have a differential of heat, um, you can actually start to create electricity. So they can be self-sustaining. Um, you might not create as much as you use for the cooling, uh, but it's not, it, you do create some extra electricity as part of this process. So um, very sustainable, um, extremely low maintenance, and potentially life-saving uh, to places like the Middle East, like Northern Africa, even uh, the Western half of the United States, definitely Australia. Uh, these kind of devices uh, can help the towns near the ocean. Uh, and then the other units um, can help people further inland. So water security is just gonna keep getting uh, to be a bigger and bigger issue. It's, it's, it's very serious. Uh, Again, in places like the Western United States, like the Southern United States, um, you look at the Middle East, uh, and they they are going to be in serious trouble in a couple of years um, when they're not able to generate enough water. And personally, what I wouldn't want to see is them having to go out of their way to buy water from other countries. And that seems to be the way we're going right now. Uh, with the bottled water industry, um, for us, it's convenient. Bottled water is just nice to have. Um, but the thing to remember is companies are shipping fresh water from the nations that have it to other nations as actual potable water uh, to help supplement uh, the gap that they have in their water production systems. So I'd rather, I'd rather either a low tech or a high tech device that helps them generate their own water uh, from atmospheric water vapor. And that's the end of my talk. So if anybody has any questions, uh, I'd love to answer them. Hey, Tony, this is Tony. How are Hi, you? Hi, Tony. Good. <laughs> it's, you have a good, interesting topic, especially with me in Colorado. Oh, yeah. um, and on that western part of the U.S. And when I saw that picture of the Australia drought, it reminds me of Lake Mead sure. and the concerns they'll have in Las Vegas and um, Los Angeles in years to come. Do you see any of these options that you've discussed as far as water purification or water condensing or any of these ideas, are they being used in the Western United States at all? Depends. The, the different, different states have different laws on atmospheric water harvesting. Um, Western water laws, I don't know if you know, is very weird. Um, and it's not, about, uh, it's not about where you sit. Um, but it's about sort of who got there first. Uh, and you can't remove the water uh, from, from your neighbor. So depending on the, the state law for someplace like Colorado, um, it might not be allowed. Uh, cisterns in Colorado, uh, you have to get special permission to make a cistern. Um, you can make a pond as long as it's open, uh, but that's, you know, that's also open to contamination too. So I think that personal uh, water harvesters will be allowed. You know what I mean? Um, so things you carry on your person, uh, maybe small things that can produce a smaller amount of water in your house. I they, just, sort of yeah, they just actually approved rain barrels this past year. Yeah, that's new, right? Before you couldn't do that. No, I, you I, the water that came down was the lands. It wasn't yours. So you yeah, could not harvest the water around your home. I know some folks up in the Poudre Valley uh, that got into trouble. They they dug some cistern, and this, this is on their land. So I mean, I don't know how they really. I mean, this is far in. These, these are ranchers, but they dug some cisterns, uh, and it was just rain collection. You know what I mean? It's not like they were pumping it off of the municipal system or anything. 
uh, but they got a huge fine uh, for collecting it. So it's it's going to have to happen that way. You know, um, there might have to be some things. Eastern water law is not that way. You know what I mean? I can collect all the rain I want. I can do, I mean, honestly, if I pay for it, I can pull it out of the lake. You know what I mean? Um, you do have to get permission to move it out of the state. But for personal use, I can do whatever I want as long as I pay for it. So I think, I think personal uh, water collectors are going to be something that people get. So imagine if you have a cabin up in the mountains, right? Yeah, that's uh, true. That's pretty much where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, well, but, but I mean, instead of carrying water all the way up the mountain, you know, you just set one of these things up outside and you have water for washing your clothes. You know what I mean? You've got water for your shower, you know. Um, again, a lot of the time with these, you know, for some of the devices that we've created, we've had to put uh, different kinds of sterilizing elements on them to make sure that the water that came out of them was potable. And that's, that's not necessarily required uh, but it's more of a safeguard. So what we, we do is we use uh, ultraviolet light to sterilize the water. And uh, that seems to work pretty well, at least to make sure that there's no problems. So to answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Otter had a question. Um, does anything in the South Pacific interest me? New Zealand already has climate change refugees moving there from the islands. So um, I don't know if, Audrey, if some of those are, are from Kiribati. Uh, but again, it's not just, Kiribati isn't the only island with, with issues. Uh, again, Tuvalu and Vanatu are facing the same kind of things. They just have more highlands. So it's not going to strike them as soon. Um, but people are moving, you know, and, and that's how it is. When refugees move in, uh, even if they're college kids and things like that, people notice different people. Um, if they get into any kind of trouble, it looks bad for the whole community, you know. So, but the government of New Zealand and the government of Australia, uh, at least with Kiribati, are welcoming these people um, because they're coming in, they're going to school, they're funded, they're fully funded. These people uh, and. They're, you know, they're learning how to be engineers. They're learning how to be politicians. You know, they're they're learning how to be doctors. Um, so that when their people come over, they've got kind of a community set up already. Anything else, Rob? Yeah, hey Tony, I I noticed. Um... You know, with the solar still, that's what uh, we're taught in the military to use in desert areas. You use a, you know, poncho and, uh, you know, you put uh, vegetation and then it creates a still. So the, those solar stills are, you know, ones that are used for survival, you know, uh, also when you do that. But what I was thinking, you know, when, when you were talking, I was thinking about out in California here in Southern California, you know, we've had that drought, you know, conditions for going on years now and and this winter we had a ton of rain this winter and 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 you know you know i was say, saying to myself when i was wa watching all this rain come down what we we are so inefficient with collecting this rain that comes in and it's all being washed into the ocean and we're sitting in the middle of a drought so it just seems that you know that you know our ability as a society to you know at least in drought stricken areas to collect water and efficiently not not as private individuals but just as a as a as a government entity and society is just lacking i don't know it's just a con i mean it's just a comment but uh, i don't you know i don't know your what your what your thoughts on it are but i mean it's just you know I, it's probably 90 something percent of that water was washed into the ocean that that would that uh, came after this whole winter of uh, huge amounts of rainfall we had in Southern California. It's going to take infrastructure changes, right? And I don't think it's a priority in the U.S. Because in all honesty, if, if push comes to shove, right, and this has been happening since I was in Wyoming, um, California can buy water from somebody else, right? So, you know, for some people, that's fine, right? For, you know, for states like Wisconsin uh, to have them divert water um, 
so that California gets it. That's that's fine by them. There isn't a lot of political will right now. Um, I don't know what it's going to take. Uh, probably, if I had to guess, what it'll take is the collapse of Las Vegas. Um, Las Vegas is on borrowed time. Uh, they're already borrowing from something like 65% of the aquifers in the state. Um, and the farmers are upset about it because it's getting hard for them to do what they need to do in the southern part of the state. So uh, that probably will be the first major, major water crisis. But it could be something else. It could be the collapse of the almond harvest out in California. Um, I don't know if you're in that part of the, the state, but most, you know, most almond, orchard, almond orchards had to call their, you know, call their numbers. They basically had to take down trees because they didn't have enough water. Uh, or there wasn't enough water to maintain them all and the trees died. So it's going to take something really to wake everybody up. I think people in the Mountain West uh, already know how precious water can be. If you're in some place like Wyoming and you already have to dig deep, deep wells just to get down to the aquifer, um, those people have cisterns. You know, those people have other methods of collecting water. Um, but again, it's it's hard when it's not in your face, you know. And when you consider it, you know, everything east of the Mississippi, for the most part, is fine. You know, we have plenty of water, but it's it's getting bad everywhere. Even places like Iowa, uh, Iowa's aquifers are getting lower and lower. They're they used to never think they could actually lower the aquifer level in Iowa, and I think now they're down to about 70% capacity. And, you know, it can only, it takes so long to recharge between rivers and rainfall. Um, you know, it takes decades to go up a couple percent. So it's crazy. It'll happen. But it'd be nicer if we could figure it out now. And and my hope is, is, is with the people I'm working with and the projects I'm working on now, that we can start with low tech uh, and personal water harvesting so that people can kind of take care of themselves when they need to, uh, and then move out to the, you know, to the building municipality level to get people involved with creating building designs that can capture water. Because, you know, any, any surface uh, can be set up with solar panels and water collected. Um, the problem is cost and what do you get out of it, you know? So in places like Nevada and Utah and California, um, maybe that's what they'll start doing with building design. They'll start you know, taking advantage of the natural sunlight and the available humidity and just collecting water. Even if it's just the municipality coming in and saying, hey, can we set these units up on your building? You know, we'll give you a tax break or we'll give you a lease fee or something like that. Uh, that's great, Tony. Thanks for that uh, that answer there. Um, uh, very, very interesting. All right. Anything else? Well, thanks for coming today. And again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to send me an email, give me a call. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate it. We'll have this up on the uh, internal website so that others can enjoy the, uh, the presentation also uh, at their leisure. Thanks, Thanks, Tony. Take care. Thanks, Tony. You too. Bye-bye.